Hi, shalom friends. I want to tell you a story about a kugel that saved a marriage. Now, for those of you who are not sure what a kugel means, kugel is a type of a casserole. Um, it's very versatile. It could be fried, it could be cooked. It could be made out of uh, potatoes, or vegetables, or noodles. It could be sweet, it could be sour, etc., etc. <clears throat> what all of they have in common is it's usually baked or fried in honor of Shabbos. So it's a Sabbath delicacy, and in, especially in Eastern Europe, where the diet was rather limited, uh, was a big spiel. It was a you know it was like the dessert or the main the main delicacy of the Shabbat meal. Okay, so let me take you back to a Ukrainian farming village some 230 years ago, and there lived a young couple. We'll call them Moshe and Sarah. And they worked very hard, like all the other people. They had some chickens. They had to. Uh, they had a little vegetable plot. They did odd jobs. Everything was made by hand. They were quite busy. Shabbos was the highlight because Shabbos was the day that they were not allowed to work, and spent as, as such, essentially it was a day of rest. Now these were Moshe and Sarah. They were very simple people. Neither one of them had any Jewish education, though they knew they were Jewish and whatever traditions they had and remembered from their parents, that's what they did. Of course, when they got married, uh, Sarah would make a kugel. And strangely enough, it tasted, when Moshe tasted that kugel, it was just like mom. Same ingredients. And this time it tasted even better because it was from his beloved wife. So how could a kugel destroy a marriage? I'll tell you. After a couple of weeks, uh, Moshe says to his wife, he says, you know, Sarah, we, we both work very hard and I wait eagerly for Friday night. And after I eat the challah, you bring out some soup. And after the soup, you bring the, the kugel. But I have to tell you something. I don't really enjoy the kugel because I'm filled already with the soup. And besides, I am so tired at night. All I want to do is really go to bed. But if you would bring the kugel first before the soup, I would really get an opportunity to enjoy it. And then, uh, even when I eat the soup half asleep, that's okay because it's not the main part of the Shabbos meal. And she very sweetly replies, Oh, Moshe, I would love to do that, but I can't. Because in my mother's house, the kugel was always served after the soup. And we just can't break a tradition. <laughs> it's, it's not allowed. And he, he listened and try to accept it. But after two, three weeks, he says to his wife, you know, this is really very silly. We're not breaking any law. It's okay if you give me the kugel first. And in this way, all of your hard work will be really appreciated. It's hard for me to appreciate the kugel when I'm already three quarters asleep and, and half full. And she says, but you know, during the last couple of weeks, I asked my neighbors. None of them remember the kugel ever being served first. Well, we, we have a dilemma over here. He was getting quite irked. His wife was making the kugel in honor of Shabbos as well as to please her husband. And yet, her husband was not being pleased because the kugel was being served too late. Well, instead of allowing this irritation to grow into a major upheaval, they decided to, for the sake of domestic harmony, they need an expert. What does God want them to do? Now, who do you go to ask for such advice? A great rabbi. So they found out that not that far from their village lived a very, very special holy rabbi, a Kabbalist, a Hasidic master, the Kashnitz Magnet and they go traveling to him. Now this man was a teacher of teacher and a rabbi of many great rabbis, <clears throat> but his heart w was open to all. And when this couple comes and they tell the, the person who's in charge of 
the appointment, it's really very, it won't take long, but it's a very, very important question that they ask, and only the rabbi can answer it. So he squeezes them in, and they come in in front of the Kajan Samagid, and he says, how can I help you? And first goes Moshe, Holy Rebbe, we celebrate the Shabbos the best we can. My wife, God bless her, makes a delicious food called the kugel. The problem is she serves it at the end of the meal when I cannot appreciate it. I want it in the beginning of the meal. And the Rebbe then looks at Sarah and what is the objection? Oh, Holy Rebbe, everything that I know I learned from my mother. And my mother never would serve the kugel in the beginning, always at the end. And I, I, I think that's, that's what God wants us to do on, on the Sabbath, to make a special kugel, a special casserole, and serve it at the end. I, I, I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. And the Rebbe is looking at these two people, very naive and innocent, but sincere. What is the proper time and the way to eat the kugel. The Rebbe thinks deeply and he says, you know, I have a solution. Why don't you make two kugels? One to serve before the soup and one after the soup. In this way, you'll be able to keep the tradition of your family and at the same time be able to please your husband. Wow, <laughs> brilliant. Why didn't they think of it? And before they leave, filled with gratitude on this really uh, complex issue, what a simple solution it is, she says, but Rebbe, what am I going to tell my neighbors when they ask me, why are you serving kugel first when it's against the tradition? So the Rebbe then said, tell them I'm following the tradition of my great rabbi, because from here onwards, he tells this couple, I'm going to ask my wife to serve kugel in the beginning of the meal as well. So you won't be the only one. You'll be able to say, oh, there are some rabbis that do it my way. And so ends this charming story. Well, what can we learn from the story? I, I derived three very, very obvious things to me. Number one, <clears throat> the simplicity of, of, of these people, notwithstanding, they understood that everything about the Shabbat meal has significance. And it wasn't that they were going to argue about this. The question was really very fundamental to them. What, what is the proper way to eat a Shabbos meal? So I'm amazed and impressed with, with their simplicity. Now, we're very wise. We know there is no such law that says that demands one food before the other. But, at, but they did not know that law. They just remembered what they had been brought up with. That was the law. So they go to a rabbi. More impressive is the way the rabbi accepted the question did not laugh, did not make fun, did not answer flippantly, did not tell them it makes no difference. He weighed both sides very seriously and he made them feel important. Moshe is important, Sarah is important, but guess what, he, he could please both. So it's not only a clever answer, but it was one that gave them both the dignity that they needed. Neither one was wrong. But I want to read into it a third lesson. What the Rebbe was, was, was dealing with is a question that me and you deal with. And that is, what is the strength of tradition? There's law and there's tradition. There are the laws of the Shabbos that you should not go out and plant. Um, do not cook on Shabbos. Those are the laws of Shabbos. And then there are traditions of Shabbos. Some people get dressed up in a certain way. Uh, the foods of Shabbos. How important are the traditions in Judaism? And I was thinking to myself, if the laws of, of, the, of Shabbat can be compared to bricks, 
the traditions would be the cement, the mortar that puts it all together. So on Shabbat, there is a law. You should honor the day with a meal. How long the meal? What do you eat at in this meal? What is the atmosphere of this meal? That's going to be dependent on your community, your upbringing, and your family traditions. And that's actually going to cement and hold strong the laws of Shabbos. So if you come from a community where on a Friday night, even if it's in the summer where it begins late, you still have um, some chicken or chicken soup. And you substitute that. You say, well, you know what? A chicken soup at the 10 o'clock at night doesn't talk to me. I'd much rather have a salad. So I'll make kiddush, some whole wheat challah, a little salad, and go to bed. You did not violate any laws. In fact, it might even be considered a healthy meal. But you did distance yourself from a tradition. And when you begin to distance yourself from a tradition, some of the concept of the Friday night meal gets somewhat loosened. And then the next day, why do I have to have uh, the traditional foods? You know what, why don't we just have uh, lasagna or something like that? Again, it is perfectly acceptable. But what would then be the difference between a Shabbos meal on Saturday and a Tuesday lunch or a picnic? So what the Rebbe was dealing with is, should a tradition be lightly discarded? If he were to tell Sarah, you know what, for your husband's sake, you, you don't have to keep that tradition. What would have been the message to Sarah? Well, I guess I don't have to keep all of the traditions. And being that she did not have that background in Jewish law, who knows what next might go. I would go even deeper. It wasn't only a question of which traditions should we keep. The Rebbe was offering another another venue. Keep the traditions and then add to the traditions. Don't take away a tradition, add to the tradition. So when I talk to people, or even personally, when I remember how we celebrated um, the holiday meals, or for that matter, the holiday atmosphere, what comes to mind is, what did we do in our house? But I don't do exactly the way I was brought up. We have, thank God, beautiful family. So the children added, and we added. But I didn't, I don't believe I detracted. I think we brought into the traditional Chabad family, Shabbat celebration, we added a tradition. And I, and well, that's my take on the story. <laughs> you might just enjoy the story. But I think there's a, a great deal to be gleaned from that story. So, What's the takeaway, my friends? There are laws, and there are traditions, and law trumps tradition. At the same time, tradition is an anchor. It actually lends support to the laws. So why don't you have your kugel and eat it too? <laughs> Do have your traditions and add to it. And let's hope and pray that our beauty, as we add to the traditions of the past, the beauty of Judaism will continue to grow and flourish.